we have a test, of course, when we come back from Thanksgiving over three things since our last test, and we have a final. So this is the last lecture of new material. What we're doing is a bit of viscosity and a bit of turbulence. All right. So recall that last time we did the ideal fluid. The ideal fluid was incompressible. It was um, it had no viscosity. It had a steady flow rate, and it had continuity from one point in time to the next. It had continuity in flow rate from one point in space to the next. So today what we want to add to all of this is viscosity. This means that there is now some friction or resistance to motion between layers of our fluid. So I, I don't recall whether I mentioned in this section or not last time what the ideal fluid itself actually would be, um, or whether there is such a thing as an ideal fluid. Obviously, there is no such thing as an ideal of anything, but there's stuff that comes very nearly close to it. For the ideal fluid, the thing that comes very nearly close to it is what's called the supercritical fluid. It does exist in nature. You can find it, oh, I think it's on the moon Titan, which is in orbit around Saturn, <coughs> is the nearest place where you can find it in abundance. Basically, you get it, you get a supercritical fluid by having something that is uh, very high pressure. As you raise the pressure of a fluid, you also raise its boiling point, and conversely, as you lower the pressure, you lower the boiling point. That's why, for example, if you go up into the mountains and want to boil water to make stew or tea or whatever, it will boil at a lower temperature high up in the mountains. You can get it to boil at 80 or 90 C rather than having to go all the way to 100 C. All right? But conversely, if you raise the pressure, then you also raise the boiling point. What happens is you keep raising the pressure, and then you raise the temperature, and you raise the pressure, you raise the temperature. The thing wants to boil, but it can't because the pressure is too high. Eventually, it turns into this thing that has a combination of the properties of a liquid and a gas. So it will have almost no viscosity, or very, very low viscosity, like a gas. But it will also be incompressible at that point the liquid. Liquids are more or less incompressible. Okay. So you can find these conditions with some of the methane that is found in Titan. You can also maybe find it very deep under the ocean here on Earth uh, if you have a volcanic vent because the pressure is very, very high, but the temperature can also be very, very high. Then you can get some supercritical fluid. For what we want to add in today is let's include viscosity. And that means that now we're very nearly talking about normal fluids like water at room temperature. Because water at room temperature, as long as you're having a steady flow of it, as long as you ignore the very minuscule amount of compression that you can get, and you can calculate how much there is by using the bulk modulus uh, versus the pressure, as long as you neglect those two very minor things, water will fulfill <coughs> the condition of ideal fluid minus the viscosity problem. All right. So what is viscosity? Well, it's basically a liquid's resistance, or any fluid's resistance, really, to shearing. It's friction between layers. Motion between layers is the same thing basically as shearing in a solid. All right, so viscosity, you could think of it as resistance to shearing for a liquid. You could think of it as friction between layers for a liquid. The upshot of it is 
if you have a liquid and it's going to be moving through some sort of a tube or pipe or what have you, the effects of friction or of viscosity really are such that you do not have a constant motion through the whole thing. So our ideal fluid, if I was going to draw the velocity vector at this, um, along this plane, it might look something like this. Everything's moving parallel to everything else. Everything's moving with the same speed. With viscosity in play, it means there's resistance to motion between different layers within the fluid. All right, so. Now, the walls of the tube aren't moving. You have a stationary tube or pipe or what have you. It's fixed in place. All right, so now there's resistance to motion between one layer and the next. What that means is the velocity field for this fluid might look more like this. there's sort of a profile to the vector field for the velocity. It's going to be fastest nearest the middle of the tube. It's going to be slower on the edges of the tube. And the reason for this is because you have a tube whose sides are not moving at all. This layer right here, therefore, has total friction between layer and fluid. It tends to slow the fluid down. This fluid is moving slowly, so it tries to slow this fluid down. This is moving slowly, it tries to slow this one down, and so on. And conversely, this is moving quickly, so it's trying to speed this one up. This one's trying to speed this one up, and so on. All right. So now you can imagine what might happen if you try to make this velocity go very, very high, a very large gradient, in other words, a large change between here and here. You get shearing, but the layers in the fluid, the streamlines of the fluid, may not be actually smooth to begin with. There may be microscopic roughness. And so as you slip one layer across the next, there's a sort of snagging effect, and that tends to throw things askew. And so what happens is that instead of the velocity vectors doing this, they start to do something like this. And so now you no longer have laminar flow, you now have turbulence. Yes? Is that why whenever you turn on, initially turn on a one of those, it's like all the way? Um, that is a separate issue. It's, it is interacting with the air. The other thing is that when you first turn it on, you don't have your steady flow established yet. It, yes, the turbulence will cause it to mix more with air, and that does cause bubbles. And of course, it has to be initial because after you've let it run for a little while, it's basically pushed all the air out. There's no air to make bubbles left. But it's a combination, yes, of the turbulent effects along with the fact that you had air present to mix, along with the fact that it's not a steady flow. You only partially fill the hose or the faucet or whatever until you've got enough water flowing. So it is, but there's more to it than just the, than just turbulence. All right. So what I want to do now that I've shown this is <coughs> walk through the following. A, how do we figure out what the viscosity of a fluid is? How do you measure viscosity? What's one way of doing it? B, if you have viscous flow, what is the equation that governs the flow rate? Okay, so basically you're going to need one more equation. The other two equations still apply. You can still apply continuity. You can still apply um, uh, energy conservation but we need another condition. So what's that new condition? 
and then maybe look at turbulence and when do we hit turbulence and, and how do we measure it? And the answer is we measure what's called a Reynolds number. All right, so first, how do we measure viscosity? There's actually quite a few ways to do it. There's quite a few ways to do it. Um, one way is to set up a mass on the end of a spring and put it into the liquid and have it bounce up and down. It has to do it very slowly, though. You don't want to get turbulence. But if you bounce the... the mass on the end of the spring up and down very slowly, then you'll get laminar flow of the fluid around the mass. You'll get a Stokes law drag if it's a spherical mass and if the spring is very thin. In other words, maybe you use like a fishing line to hook the weight at the end onto <coughs> the spring. And so you get what's called damped harmonic oscillations, specifically underdamped. And so what happens is the oscillations will decay in time. So they'll look more like this. This dashed line is badly drawn, but it's an exponential decay. It has some value e to the negative gamma t. It turns out that this gamma term contains viscosity. So you can measure it this way. Okay. There's another way that the common way that it's measured anymore is you put it in basically a fancy blender, thing with a little mixing stir rod, and it measures how much force does it have to apply to mix the fluid around. That will also get you a viscosity. Okay, there's a third way to do it. <coughs> this is the easiest one to actually mathematically describe. And so it's the one that you have, for example, on your homeworks and whatnot. The third <coughs> way to do it is you get a container that has some fluid in it. All right, and you put at the bottom of the container some plate, and at the top, you put another plate. And what you do is you attach a force sensor here, or a string here attached to a force sensor, and you apply some amount of force to this plate. And you do it so that it moves at a constant velocity. So however much force you need to get it to move at some constant velocity, V is a velocity V, or speed and direction. All right, and so you pull this guy along at some constant speed, and you measure what is the distance, the height or length or distance, whatever you want to say, between the two plates. And you measure what is the area of all this. Right. The viscosity of your fluid, as it turns out, is given really the force needed to pull the plate is given by your viscosity. Eta is coefficient of viscosity, or viscosity for short, times the cross-section area of the plate, times the speed that you're pulling, divided by the length L. Okay. So recall, as I said before, viscosity gives you resistance to shearing. You basically expect something like force divided by area, that's some sort of a stress, to be equal to some sort of a strain. And so what we've done here is we've rearranged the terms of strain. So 
of stress, F over A, is equal to some resistance. times strain, which in this case is like a delta L or a delta X over L. Okay. So your resistance term has in it a viscosity term and it has in it a time term, as it turns out. Okay. So all of this is to say that if you want to get the viscosity, <laughs> uh, what you need is to rearrange your equation to say that eta is stress, force per unit area, divided by strain, which in this case looks like L over B. Okay, so this is your equation for finding the coefficient of viscosity. Now what's the expected units for a coefficient of viscosity? Well, I just told you that this right here is a similar equation to the one that we got in chapter um, 11, unit 11, which says that the stress sigma is the modulus of elasticity times the strain epsilon. Epsilon is unitless. Stress is in pascals. Okay. So your modulus of elasticity has to also be in pascals, but this is offset from modulus of elasticity by a factor of time. So we expect the units to be something like pascal second. In your book, there's a table for measured fluid viscosity values. It's not by any stretch of the imagination a complete table. It has values for a few gases, um, air at a variety of temperatures, and <coughs> ammonia, and carbon dioxide, hydrogen, mercury, oxygen, that kind of stuff, steam, at a variety of temperatures. Then it gives for some liquids, water, is an obvious liquid to use. Blood. Blood actually is an obvious one to use historically because all this stuff was historically studied because people were trying to study how does blood propagate through the body? How does blood move through the various veins and arteries? Um, including blood, whole blood, but also just the plasma. Some values are given. And the temperatures that it gives are 20 degrees C and 37 degrees C. Why those two temperatures? Why 20 and 37? So 20 is taken as room temperature. So that one's a common one to specify stuff in. What's 37 have to do with? seems like a really random number to pick. Why would we care about the viscosity of blood at 37 degrees C? Yeah? It's an average human body temperature. All right, so we might be interested in how does blood move through an actual body and not just through a cadaver. To do that, we need to know the actual <coughs> temperature of the blood, which should be approximately the temperature of the body that it's moving through. Uh, for fun, the table also has other stuff like motor oil and olive oil, glycerin, honey, maple syrup. You know, some very high viscosity stuff, some very low viscosity stuff. One thing to note about this table, and what I'll do here is I'm going to open it in your book, if I can find your book, and I'm going to put it up because this bears uh, pointing out. 
is that the units on the table are not MKS units. They are SI units, but they're not in MKS. See if, uh, see if the book will actually open for me. This guy This site can't be reached. This does not bode well for us. Scroll down a bit, and it's in this section here, 12.4. There it is. <coughs> so the whole table will not fit in one screen and also be legible. Might be able to zoom out and get it all in one. There you are, there it is in one screen, but none of you can read it. Okay. So zooming in just a bit to make it legible, you'll notice that the viscosity values are given in millipascal seconds. Okay. So if you want to use this in an equation that has, for example, energy or work, energy and work, power, anything like that, you're going to have to convert the units into Pascal's. <coughs> so all of these are really times 10 to the minus 3 Pascal seconds in units that are usable for solving questions that ask you for how much energy is used and so on, you know, like on the home. Okay. Now, why would we put it in these units? Well, because these units, although they look really small already for air and other gases, they're actually fairly convenient once we get into stuff like water and blood and ethyl alcohol. We're looking at 1 1.8, 1, 1.732, this kind of thing. So these are pretty useful units, the millipascal seconds, they're pretty convenient units. <coughs> When we're dealing with actual liquids, which are the usual thing that you're trying to measure viscosity for. Of course, when you get into some heavier stuff, oils, for example, you start getting some high viscosities. This is your heavy machine oil, and this is your SAE10. So this is what's in your car or truck for most people. Not all. And then this is like heavy machinery. Um, think of like a bulldozer or a battleship. Oh, okay, battleships are not obsolete, but we don't use them anymore. So think of an aircraft carrier. And then if you want some heavier ones, we've got glycerin, honey, and maple syrup. And of course, honey and maple syrup have some range because, well, they're not all the same. You, know, you have different grades of syrup, for example. You have different grades and weights of honey, maybe from different uh, you know, clover versus some other flower that the bees uh, getting the raw materials from. And, of course, for these, it's all just at 20 degrees C. What do you expect to happen as a temperature relationship? Do you expect when you heat the fluid for the viscosity to go up or go down? Down? It does. And you can double check that with this table, if you'd like. <coughs> because some things, like blood and plasma, have multiple temperatures. Some things, like water, have lots of temperatures. And you can see for water, as you decrease the temperature, or as you, uh, excuse me, as you increase the temperature, 0, 20, 37, 40, 100, you are steadily decreasing the viscosity. 
interesting fact about this, by the way, you can go try this on your own sometime, you can hear viscosity. You can hear differences of viscosity. If you don't believe me, here's a simple take-home experiment that you can try. It works best if you have a friend, by the way, to do it. The reason why it works best with a friend is you can have your friend do the pouring and you can be blindfolded so you can guess. Take one cup, one glass of water, put it in the refrigerator so it gets very cold. Take another glass, preferably a pitcher by the way, and fill it with hot water, like boiling hot. Now take these two glasses while you're blindfolded or have your friend take these two glasses and pour the cold water into a cup and listen to it. And then put the cup aside and pour the hot water into either the same cup after emptying it or an identical cup. And listen and see if you can hear the difference. You can, for most of you anyway. Not only can you hear it, but you can almost certainly guess which one is which just from the sound of it. Why do they make the different sounds? Because the, dis the viscosity is different at the two temperatures, and so the splashing is different at the two temperatures. The flowing is different at the two temperatures. All right. So... Next thing that I wanted to get to is how fluids actually flow. This is, uh, and I should say, how a viscous fluid actually flows. And to do this, what we use is what's called Pouazzi's theorem, or Pouazzi's equation. How is that spelled? P O. And Pawazi's equation, Pawazi was actually interested in how does blood flow through the body. So historically, this came about from a study on basically anatomy and physiology. Okay, and he knows that, yeah, there's got to be some friction and drag, therefore we expect this. We don't expect this for blood, this would be bad. Expect something like this for blood as it flows through arteries. We expect that as the artery gets bigger or smaller, you know, a really large artery, obviously we don't have any that are this big, but a large artery means that you have more layers and therefore the gradient can be smaller between layers or, in other words, an equal gradient means a much faster flow near the center than for a small artery. The upshot of this is, in the case of veins and arteries, other viscous liquids flowing through tubes, bigger actually can be better. You get more volume flow rate for a larger than for a smaller. What his actual equation says is this. Q, the volume flow rate of your viscous liquid, is equal to change in pressure divided by resistance to flow. So this right here is volume flow rate, introduced last time. That's how much volume per unit time. This right here is pressure difference. Specifically, it's the pressure difference from the beginning of the tube to the end of the tube, from the beginning of the pipe to the end of the pipe. Okay, so we might say from start to finish, or beginning to end. <coughs> in 
egress to egress. And this right here is called resistance. All right. Now the resistance to flow is itself has some equation to it. All right. What do we expect the resistance to flow to depend on? All right. Surely viscosity has some role to play here. Surely a very viscous material is going to tend to slow more, to flow more slowly through the same tube as a less viscous material. You all have experience with this. If you have honey or syrup that you like to pour on whatever, breakfast, tea, snow, don't have snow. Well, if you have snow, pour it on snow. It's very good. But you know that if you go out and it is snowy, you try to pour the honey out, it doesn't come out. So then you have to heat it up to get it to actually fall out of the, the container. All right, so we know that viscosity has got to be some proportionality. It turns out it's proportional to the first power. All right. Now, there's a few constants constant coefficients that go with this. It's actually 8 over pi. There's two other things that determine resistance to flow. These have less to do with the fluid than they do with the thing that the fluid is flowing through. Alright. If you have a really long pipe, do you expect the fluid to be able to for the same pressure difference, in other words, for the same work put into the fluid, do we expect the fluid to be flowing more quickly at the end or more slowly at the end for a very long pipe? Okay, why slowly? Okay, that's a good way of putting it. As a greater distance to travel, that means that Recall that what's happening here is you have friction between the edges, or the, basically the sides of the tube, and the liquid. So it's due to the viscosity in the liquid. The longer this distance is, if viscosity is the same, it's sort of like you have the same force that's been applied between the two, but you have a longer distance that you're traveling. So work goes like force times distance. If you've increased the distance, then the work you've done against the fluid has also increased. So the length has to be here in the numerator of this. Now let's consider the other uh, factor in the two. You have, what else could we have? We could have material that the tube is made out of. Turns out that that's not terribly important. You could have, um, what else? You could have how big across the tube. Do I expect, or do you expect, the size of the tube, the radius, the diameter, do you expect that to make the tube more or less resistant to flowing? Less resistant. Less resistant? Okay, why would it be less resistant? There's a greater distance between the two Okay, and therefore? <laughs> okay, there's a greater distance and therefore there's less resistance. There's more layers of flow. Okay, there's more layers of flow. So one way to look at it is you have more layers of flow, and so for the same gradient, gradient basically means change in flow rate, for the same change in flow rate between adjacent layers, you have more layers and therefore your middlemost layer can be moving faster. All right, that's one way of looking at it. The other way of looking at it, as it turns out, is you could think of it as what fraction of the fluid is in that layer that is making contact with the pipe, because that's the layer that is directly being worked on by something that's stationary. OK, 
Okay, so the more fluid that's in contact with that, the more work is being done evenly to all this fluid. The, basically, the more total force is being exerted on the fluid for the same distance, and hence the more work. All right, so if you can minimize the surface area to volume ratio, then you're going to maximize your flow rate. All right, now the surface area here tends to go like R, because we're counting the lateral area of it, not the cross section. So the lateral area is R times H times 2 pi. The volume is R squared times H times pi. All right, so the wider it gets, the greater is the fraction of volume that's not in direct contact with this thing that is stationary. Now, it turns out that this is a pretty big effect. The resistance to flow actually goes like L over R to the fourth power. So this is the most important term in this resistance to flow equation. It's the R to the fourth power. Okay, and this, by the way, you want to put these together. What this means is that your volume flow rate is your pressure at the entrance minus your pressure at the exit, that's your delta P, times pi r to the fourth divided by 8 eta L. All right. So this, this right here, you could say this is Pouazzi's equation, but this is Pouazzi's equation with actually measurable quantities in it, directly measurable quantities. All right, quick application of this. What's a common problem in America that people have because of poor lifestyle choices that has to do with blood vessels? Yeah? Okay, high blood pressure. And like plaque buildup? Okay. Are these two things related? Yeah. Absolutely. Why are they related? Because it's the circumference of the circle. Where the blood can go through decreases and the pressure increases. Okay. So let's consider somebody who has a bit of a plaque buildup in the blood vessel. This means that R is effectively decreased. It's not the circumference, it's the radius, right? So you decrease the radius by, say, 10%, right? What does that do? Well, in order to get the same flow rate, if you've just decreased the value of R and you want this to stay constant, this quantity has to go up, has to go up by a lot, has to go up to account for how much this went down by. What produces this quantity here, the delta P, pressure in versus pressure out? So what pressure can your, your heart, what force does your heart apply per unit area to your blood? So if you've dropped this, if you reduce R by 10%, 10% genes, we're looking at the blood vessel here. Here's a healthy blood vessel. Yep, about like this. We've reduced from this to this. What factor have we just increased the necessary pressure by in order to get the same flow rate? All right. So we have a 10% reduction. This means that before this happens, R is, for example, 1. 
after it happens, r is now 0.9. Right, so we take 0.9 and we raise it to the fourth power. What do you think you get when you take 0.9 and raise it to the fourth power? It's about 65%. So, R new over R old is equal to 0 0.65, roughly. This means delta P new over delta P old must be 1 over 0 0.65 to get the same amount of uh, volume flow rate. That's a factor of 1.5 for what it's worth means your heart has to work 50% harder than before for the same volume flow rate. Do you think your heart can stand working 50% harder all the time, 24-7? Suddenly it makes sense why this is such a big issue. <coughs> Suddenly you see why people have heart attacks when they have this plaque buildup. One last thing, and then we're out of time, unfortunately. And that's to figure out when turbulence sets in. What causes there to be turbulence? So there's a few things that can cause turbulence. One is a sudden sharp change in the direction that the fluid is flowing. So if you have a T-junction, like a, if you look at plumbing, Sometimes there's a T-junction set up, so you'll have like two, and then they go into one, uh, like one larger tube or whatever to go out. That's a sharp change. You've gone from this way and this way to suddenly this way. There tends to be a little bit of turbulence around those areas. The other thing that can cause turbulence, as I said before, is if the flow rate or really the flow speed gets high enough. All right. Now we can use what's called an average flow speed. The way that you do that is once you have used Blasi's equation to get your flow rate, then you have the actual area of your tube. The area times the average flow speed gets you Q. All right. So before we just wrote Q equals little v times a. Now we can modify it to say it's average of v, the average of all this stuff times a. All right, so with that in mind, you can determine the value for v. Then what you do is you calculate a thing called Reynolds number. Reynolds number is what tells you what regime are you in. There's actually two Reynolds numbers two ways to calculate it. One is if you're flowing through a closed channel like a pipe or tube. And for that, what you use is N sub R. Reynolds number oops, is 2 times the density of the fluid times the average speed of the fluid times the radius of the pipe divided by the viscosity. So this right here would represent the radius of the pipe. All right, for this Reynolds number, your regimes of interest occur, there's three really. If the Reynolds number is less than 2,000, then you should have laminar flow. If N sub R is greater than about 3,000, these are approximations, the flow should be totally turbulent. If it's between these two numbers, then it's transitioning to turbulent. It means there's a little bit of turbulence, but not necessarily very much. All right, the other form of Reynolds number, I'll write it in red. 
The other form of Reynolds number is what's called a modified Reynolds number. And what it's given by is essentially the same equation. It's rho times the flow speed times a characteristic wave scale divided by a viscosity. This is what you get if instead of flowing through a pipe, you're trying to flow around something. So maybe you have like a boulder which is in a river and your stream is like this. Right? When it gets to this boulder, it has to somehow flow around it. Right. L, in this case, is some characteristic length scale. For a spherical object, it turns out that L is actually equal to the diameter. So it has the same basic definition is what you had here, where you had twice the radius, or in other words, the diameter of the tube is equivalent to twice the radius, the diameter, of your spherical object. If it's not spherical, though, then you'll have some additional factors up here. All right. For this one, the range is a little bit different. N sub r less than about 1 laminar. N sub r greater than about a million is totally turbulent. In between those two, you're transitioning. It turns out that between about 1 and 10, it's mostly laminar, but you may have a little bit of turbulence at the two edges. And if you get to, you know, between 10 and 10 to the 6, you're really transitioning into turbulence. You start seeing more turbulence, and it just spreads until it totally surrounds the object. And that's it. We're done.